Well, friends, welcome to Science Talk. I'm your host and resident oceanographer, Jim Massa. Okay, I want to uh, discuss with you um, this article uh, that was uh, posted on uh, Eco Environment Coastal and Offshore. And uh, my friend Kevin Hester uh, sent me this article. Uh, so thank you, Kevin. And uh, as we can see here, Southern Ocean storms cause outgassing of carbon dioxide. So what is going on here? First of all, uh, Southern Ocean uh, scene here. Uh, this is actually be a, like a calm day. <laughs> like you can see a research vessel here and you see um, a research, uh, some research tools being uh, deployed. So what we got going on is that what they're finding is that storms over the waters around Antarctica drive an outgassing of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is based on a new international study with uh, researchers from the University of uh, Gothenburg. The research group used advanced uh, ocean robots for the study, and it provides more data, able to fill in some gaps in the data. And of course, anytime you can improve your data, you fill gaps in, you can, we, you can get better climate models. And like, uh, as I showed you in my uh, updated ocean heat content video, uh, the North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean are some of the uh, areas on the, uh, some of the oceans, of so the major ocean, that have absorbed a lot of the heat energy uh, that humans have put in, which of course includes a lot of CO2. So this should not come as a surprise that the Southern Ocean around the Antarctica has a critical role in the global climate uh, situation because its uh, waters contain large amounts of CO2. Well, the waters are cold. Colder waters can hold more dissolved gases. Gas solubility increases with a decrease in water temperature. That should not come as a surprise. The new international study uh, examined the co uh, complex processes driving air-sea fluxes of gases such as carbon dioxide. Flux is basically uh, a volume per unit area per time. And I'll show you in the article, they calculate it as a moles of CO2 per uh, square meter per year. That's, that's all a flux is. It's, a, it's an amount of volume per unit area per unit time. It could be second, day, month, year, what have you. So the storms bring carbon dioxide rich waters to the surface and basically what they're saying is that you get intense storms and they churn the water, right? A lot of intensive mixing. So when you get, you get this in, uh, mixing and the mixing can bring CO2 from deep down to the surface where at the air water interface, it can then move into the atmosphere. And like also the, the mixing will bring in nutrients as well. So eventually, when you get some stratification, you can get some productivity. But the storms are driving the outgassing of CO2 from the ocean to the atmosphere. Now, there's been a lack of knowledge about these complex uh, processes. So this information pro uh, is able to improve our understanding for the Southern Ocean's role in the climate and global carbon budget. And that was from Sebastian Swart, who's a professor of oceanography at University of Gutenberg and a co-author. So now the, so, so they go on to talk about, you know, you know, the, the pioneering use of ocean robotic to, in, to collect more data and fill in some gaps in our knowledge, increase, improve our modeling and so on. But I want to discuss briefly what's going on in the air sea uh, interface. One of the questions that would arise is, okay, you've got the CO2 going from the ocean to the atmosphere. 
What about CO2 going from the atmosphere to the ocean? Does that happen? Yes. You get the mixing. You can you know, drive the, whatever the gas is into the water, dissolve it, and you know, increase the concentration in the water. What has to be considered is what is the total input? What is the total output? Okay. Like anything else, construct a budget. You've heard me say this before. You construct budget, input, output, and then see how it shakes out. When you actually come down to when you consider the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere versus the concentration of CO2 dissolved in water, the latter is higher, considerably higher. So from a concentration gradient, it favors the net movement of more CO2 from the water to the atmosphere. And that was the concentration allows a net movement of CO2 to the atmosphere, increasing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. That's the important thing to keep in mind. The net output is greater than, you know, the output is greater than the input giving us a net more to the atmosphere. So, they then reference this article from where it comes from, and I'm just going to pull that up right now. So, here it is in Nature Communications. And um, you see storms drive out gas and CO2 in the subpolar uh, southern ocean. There's a Sebastian uh, Swart appearing as a, uh, one of the co-authors. And uh, look at the, I'm not going to go through the entire article, but there are some things I, I do wish to point out from the results that I find uh, to be interesting. The subpolar southern ocean is a critical region where CO2 outgassing influences the global mean air sea CO2 flux, designated as F subscript CO2. Okay. The mean air sea flux. Okay, that's just basically what I just said. That what is the net overall result? Output to the atmosphere is greater than input from the atmosphere into the ocean. However, the processes controlling the outgassing remain elusive. We show using multi layer data set uh, combines uh, CO two flux and ocean turbulence that the air sea gradient of CO two, calculated as delta p. Now that's P, CO2. That's not the Greek letter rho for density. Okay, that's P, basically meaning partial. It is modulated by synoptic storm driven ocean variability, about 20 micro atmosphere over one to 10 days through two processes. Ekman transport explains 60% of the variability, and entrainment drives strong episodic CO2 outgassing events of two to four moles per square meter per year. There's your flux right here. Okay. Right there. That is your per, per year. That is your flux. Extrapolation across the subpolar southern ocean using a process model shows how ocean front spatially modulates synoptic variability in the delta P CO2, about six micro atmospheres squared average, and how spatial variations in stratification influence synoptic entrainment of deeper carbon into the mixed layer. Entrainment just basically means you include it. And that's a, on the order of about 3.4 moles per square, uh, per square meter per year average. Now, mole is a type of concentration. Um, Carbon dioxide, if you were to calculate the molecular weight, it's 44. So if you have, uh, you know, 44 grams per liter, that's one mole of solution, th that kind of stuff there. Uh, so that's what a mole is. It's a, a mole of solution is how many moles of a material dissolved uh, per, per liter. So these results not only constrain alias-driven uncertainty in the flux, but also the effects of synoptic variability on slower seasonal or longer ocean physics carbon dynamics. Okay. Now, what I wanted to show you here you know, is in the results here. So 
here they're looking at the the fluxes okay? observe temporal variability in the L gassing domain and uh, where we see that and this is in moles of carbon per square year per year and you can see that there's some indicate like right here we've got some out gassing okay this is from December 18th to February 19th, so three month period. But then look when we get to here, right, about 60 degrees south latitude, we see quite a bit of outgassing. And keep in mind, if you get on about approximately 60 degrees southern latitude, you can go twirling around the on that latitude and not encounter any land. So the oceans can get uh, rip roaring pretty quick there. Now, this first right here is what I wanted to show you. So it shows you uh, basically outgassing. So the delta P of CO2 is equal to, it's basically the difference between uh, what's in the sea and what goes into the atmosphere. So in essence, what you see the pink that's above the zero is outgassing. Right? And then the gray is the storms. So we see gray region here. This is a storm, outgassing. Gray region here, outgassing. Now, there are a couple of times when you have a storm, such as here and here, where there's no outgassing. So that's interesting. But we have a storm here, another outgassing, another outgassing. So a lot of these, when they, it's a pretty good uh, correlation, pretty good uh, relationship. I think they uh, did some analyses and they had an R square like 0 0.75 relating the outgassing to wind. Okay. These two events here and here probably reduced that R square. So they're showing a pretty strong uh, correlation there. And where's the and what I was interested in, and I was glad to see that they did address this in this article, was um, to what layer, to what depth did the storms did the, uh, affect? To what, how deep was the mixing felt at? And we see this right here. Okay? The log scale uh, you know, square meters per uh, per cubic uh, second. That's basically uh, a change in acceleration, the third derivative. Like when you hear, you know, Earth's gravitational, uh, you know, the constant, you know, nine point eight meters per second squared. Well, that's what acceleration is. The change in velocity. Velocity is meter per second. So acceleration is a change in velocity per second. So it's meter per second per second. When you simplify it, it algebraically, it becomes meters per second square. Well, we have uh, per cubic uh, second. That's what? That's a change in the acceleration. Acceleration is meters per second per second. Well, if you change the acceleration, that's also a change per second. So meters per second per second per second simplifies to, to meters per cubic second. No such thing as a cubic second. It's simply an algebraic simplification. But we see it. We see that it's approximately, you know, the, the dash line is the mixed layer depth. And the, uh, excuse me, is the uh, mean layer depth, the XLD. The solid line is the mixed layer depth, okay? And we see that it varies, and it can go down to about 150 meters or so. We see that here. And by the way, right, here's a storm. It gets mixed down. Here's another storm. It gets mixed down. Every time we see these little bars here, little gray bars, we see the mixing going deeper into the down in the uh, water column, which could then pull up the CO2 and, and enable it to outgas back to the atmosphere. So that's what this is showing. So, um, 
And what I do wanted to discuss with you, I'm, uh, probably get down to the results section. Yeah, some little, some little mathematics here. Okay, so they say here the mixed layer that the MLD was calculated as the depth from the surface where the density first exceeds its surface value by 0 0.03 kilograms per cubic meter. The mixing layer depth was estimated using the microwriter derived epsilon profile as the depth from the surface where epsilon first drops below 10 to the minus 8 per square meter per cubic second. In other words, basically the change in the jerk, the accelerating changes in the mixing. So they make in a, um, so the MLD is the mixed layer depth, and this is the mixing. So the mixed layer depth persists a little bit longer. So you have the effects of the, uh, the mixing, and then you can think of the mixed layer depth as sort of like a, the accumulation, the averaging, the smoothing of all this turbulence that happens above it. But the point here is they're showing quite clearly that when you have wind stress, wind stress blows across horizontally, that sets up vertical mixing, and that the stronger the winds, the deeper it goes in vertical mixing. That allows entrainment of CO2, nutrients, whatever. It brings all that to shallower depths. And if you've got CO2, it gets closer to the air-water interface because the concentration is greater in the ocean than in the atmosphere. The net result would be more diffusion to the atmosphere. And that's what they show clearly in that graphic as well as uh, this graphic here. So th that's really what I wanted to show, uh, show to you from uh, this uh, paper. But this is a very interesting finding. So then that could, go to that, that could, uh, that could not could, it will increase our CO2 uh, levels, which will then impact global warming. So, you know, everyone thinks that, oh, you just heat up the atmosphere and then you, you know, or you just simply put CO2 into the atmosphere, temperatures lag behind it. And then it, and these people who don't know, know better then say, see, the CO2 levels increase before the temperature increase when there's actually two mechanisms at work here. You have, you put the CO2 into the atmosphere, temperatures increase. But there are also things going on that add CO2, which is the result from previous adding of CO2 through fossil fuel combustion, that those additional in inputs of CO2 also increase the temperature. And that is basically CO2 outgassing from the ocean to the atmosphere. These people who st state that you know CO2 doesn't uh, cause temperature increases are dismissing, not understanding the roles of the ocean. And I've, and I've shown you, discussed with you, that uh, CO2 the concentration in the ocean, the ocean is a great source of CO2 that does impact what happens with global temperatures. So you burn the fossil fuels, you add CO2. There's a lag effect when those effects are felt. Well, a lot of that CO2 along the heat energy goes to the ocean. Eventually, it outgasses. So here is, and that outgassing causes additional rises in CO2, causing additional rises in temperature. Here is a possible mechanism, one of maybe several mechanisms, by which CO2 goes back into the atmosphere. Plain and simple. So, there you have it. More ways to throw CO2 into the atmosphere and to increase the warming, which is why, again, you know, 5 to 11 C by the end of the century is really not unreasonable. Thank you for your time. Hello, folks. This is Jim here with Science Talk.
asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.